Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Rick Eatser here with Aragon Web, your home for old school Aragon reviews, and where we tell you the facts, not fluff. Today, we have a kind of an interesting video, and let me just say where this is coming from is I've received more than one or two uh, comments or emails about how to set up your scope properly. And we've done videos on this before, and we've shown the process. But today I really want to try and get some footage that really shows what's happening as you attach the scope and just kind of do it from a different perspective, kind of bring a brand new air gunner through the process of you've got your new air gun, you're ready to go do some shooting, and now you need to get that scope mounted. Uh, if you've never done it, it can be a little bit tricky and we want to make it easy for you. So today we're going to just jump right in. I don't have a big script for this. I don't know how long it's going to take, and I'm not going to try and rush it. We're just going to take our time and go through the process. And uh, yeah, hopefully this will be really useful um, to new, new folks. And if you're an old timer, uh, maybe you'll learn something new in the process. We're going to be working with the Gamo. Uh, this is the Gamo Swarm Magnum. This is the new Gen 3i. Now, the new Gen 3i has essentially a brand new magazine that is, well, they've had the inertia driven that worked really well with the Magnums, but now the new 3i, the new Gen 3, works across all of their guns. So the inertia mag, what it does is it doesn't advance to the next pellet in the mag until you fire the gun, which is really cool. It helps prevent double feeding. You can still accidentally double feed if you try, <laughs> or, uh, you know, it's possible, but it definitely takes part of that out of the, well, it definitely helps mitigate that as a potential problem. A couple of things you don't want to do with a brake barrel is you really don't want to dry fire them, and you really don't want to double feed them. So either way is bad, and uh, this at least helps eliminate the uh, double feeding side of things. So the first thing we need to do, obviously, is we'll get this out of the box, and we'll take a look at it, go through the parts. Now, in the manual, it does walk through the process, but there's some things we want to talk about about why you're doing it and uh, or some, why you actually need to go through this process. Um, so hopefully that'll, again, be useful to you. Um, lighting is kind of strange today because we have... Uh, sh um, we have a cloudy and sunny and cloudy and sunny, so please forgive the variations in the exposure. Hopefully that won't be a, too much of a distraction. Um, this is a brand new gun. I, I got this in and I have not even opened it up yet. So we're gonna go do that right now. Okay, I'm gonna just set this down for a minute. Okay. That's upside down, I know, but we're gonna open it up here. Okay, so this is what you got. Um, you get, obviously, you get the rifle, our magazine. Um, these inertia mags are really cool. Uh, a little a tool, this might be for adjusting the trigger, I don't know. Our scope and our booklets. So with all that, and we have a little thing that says it's been checked out and it's good to go. All right, so we got all that in there. Um, let's set this down, move this out of the way. Okay, so we will get the other camera going here and get some real close-ups on stuff. Uh, but let's just go through the basics, which we don't need. We don't need another camera for that right now. Oh. All right. So one of the big changes when they went to the Gen 3 uh, the Gen 3i, I should say, at least on the Magnum and the other guns. Uh, some of them used to have open sights. They do not have that anymore. Um, the comb of the stock really sort of made the open sights unusable, so they had a choice. Um, reduce the comb and make it less usable for a scope, or uh, kind of get rid of the open sights. And since most people are going to scope their gun anyway, they went with the, uh, let's just get rid of the open sights. Uh, not my choice. <laughs> I would have preferred them reduce the comb on the stock or make it an adjustable comb, but uh, bottom line is most people are going to scope the gun. Very few people want to run it with open sights. Maybe some of us old timers do, but the vast majority, like 95 out of 100, want to run a scope, so it makes good sense that that's the direction they went. Okay, get rid of this now. Okay, I'll get my stand back up here. Whenever you're working on stuff like this, it really helps to have some sort of stable platform you're going to be working off of. So if that is a rifle rest or 
some sort of um, uh, maintenance toolbox, uh, gun box or something, it really helps. So I'm going to use this because it's what I got out here uh, for right now. Okay, so here's your manual. I mean, whoops. I know that most of us, especially us guys, uh, we refer to this uh, only in case of emergency. Um, and when things don't work, then maybe we'll look at it. Uh, or maybe we'll go to a YouTube video and say, why isn't this working? But this actually goes through all of the steps on how to mount the scope, how to adjust the scope. It's actually all in here. Um, I encourage you to, you know, read it. If you're brand new to this, take five minutes, look through the manual. It's going to be good information. It's going to be helpful. All right, so this is Gamo's standard scope. This is their um, 3 to 9 by 40. It is a duplex reticle, which means that um, it's just crosshairs with no mill dots, and usually you'll have thin lines, and then it'll switch to thick lines. So it's about, eh, about half in the center is thin, and then it kind of goes to thicker lines on the outside. That's called a duplex reticle. <clears throat> Let's get this out here. Oh, okay. Um, we also have more instructions in the box. Again, this actually talks <clears throat> about the scope, its capabilities, how to adjust it. All of that stuff is actually in the manuals. I, again, would suggest if you're brand new to this, take five minutes, go through it, and read that and read those instructions. They're going to be useful. Okay. So here's our scope. Now, there's a couple things we're going to talk about here which are sort of physics related uh, and why we have a stop pin, why we have this rail here and all of these things on your gun and why uh, it's, it's kind of really tricky for some and they really struggle with getting a scope to one mount properly and two stay mounted properly. Okay, so the way this works is there's a piston in here and when you cock the gun it compresses that piston and it latches onto the trigger or the sear, okay? So when you pull the trigger, it releases that piston. The piston is a big hunkin' chunk of metal. It's very heavy, uh, and the piston has got a lot of energy and force behind it. It flies forward. That's what makes the pressure that drives the pellet out down the barrel. But it doesn't like stop short. It actually slams into the front of the compression chamber here. So when you pull it back, it creates a void that fills with ambient air, whatever your air pressure is. We're at 4,600 feet. That's why a brake barrel here will have less power than, say, a brake barrel at sea level because the air here is thinner. Um, denser air is going to go faster. It's just, again, physics, mechanics, so forth. So as you draw this back, it fills this void. And when you fire, it very, very, very quickly flies forward, creates a compression, and drives the pellet out. When that piston hits the front of this gun, it causes the gun to jar forward. Now, here's our scope. Our scope is sitting on here like this. And when that jars forward, this will want uh, the way um, energy and other things work, uh, action, reaction type things, when that gun jumps forward, this is going to want to stay still. And if this is staying still, the gun jumps forward, it's going to want to slide back. So there's a stop pin right in here. And that stop pin is going to go into this hole right here. So right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go get my other camera set up so that we can get this zoomed in. You all can see tight, close in what I'm doing here as we go ahead and mount this scope and walk through the rest of this process. I'll be right back. Okay, so we've got our other camera set up. Hopefully you guys are getting a good shot of this. So let me go back through some of this again. There is this rail. This is called the Gamos Recoil Reducing Rail. The point of this is that when the scope is mounted hard to the receiver, it uh, the force transmitted into the scope can be pretty significant. It's why a lot of scopes break. The point of this recoil reducing rail is it's a little bit of a buffer. So right in here, we've got some rubber stoppers. We've got a very large stop pin that is held in place with this screw, prevents this whole thing from sliding. So it allows a bit of kind of a buffer, really, a, a way to reduce the recoil that's transmitted from the receiver into the scope. The whole mount is going to go on this front part, and if there is any movement, or I guess there, the point is that as they're 
as there is movement, these little rubber bumpers help absorb some of that before it gets up into the scope. Now this hole right here, the way we used to do it back in the day, uh, we had all manner of things we used to do to try and get our scopes to not slide off the back of the gun. Remember, when that piston hits forward, the gun wants to go forward. If you have something attached, it's going to want to stay put or not move. And so unless it's really secured, it's going to want to slide off the back. So we used to do all kinds of things, like we'd little mark with pencil and we'd be able to see if our scope's shifting or sliding. The stop pin is something that a lot of companies sort of came up with. So on the bottom of the mount here, we have a pin. I'll show you right here. There's a pin right there. And that pin lines up with this hole. The reason we do that is that locks this in. So as the gun jumps forward, there's something hard and rigid that prevents the scope from slipping. Um, even though they have this, this sort of one piece heavy duty mount, the reality is that the more mass you have in the scope, the harder it is for it to stay put. So you could have the big heavy duty mount, well that just means not only do you have to stop the scope from moving, but now you also have to stop the mount from moving. So you really need something uh, that, that can drive into this hole here that's going to stop the whole thing from shifting. So we're going to go ahead and just finger tighten these and I'll get my tool out. Um, I believe this is going to use torque bits. Now I have the fix it sticks. I love these things, but it does come with the tool in the bag. So if you don't have an Allen key, if you don't have like an exact tool, let me get this in frame. Good. That's good enough. If you don't have the exact uh, tool, then it does come with one, but I, th these work really good for me. Except when I drop them on the ground. Okay. <sighs> Let's see here. Oh, too big. Okay, it's that one. Okay. All right. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and tighten these down. And you don't wanna tighten them down, like wrench it all the way down. You wanna Tighten them kind of as you go. So a little bit here, that's still the wrong size. No, actually, that's a bad screw. It's got a little burr in it, so hold on. There we go. So we're gonna do a little bit at a time. That one's done. Now this has not only a lot of pressure connecting it to this rail, but it's got that stop pin, so it should not shift. That's really important. The other thing we need to do is make sure that our top screws are done, so we'll do that here in just a minute. Um, I've had many times which I've gone to like Gamo Squirrel Master Classic, and we'll be I'll be there early helping set up guns, and <laughs> The, uh, they've mounted this, but then they forgot to check the top screws, and the scopes are all all going all over the place. And uh, yeah, so you got to make sure that's done too. So you want to make sure these are tight. I'm going to loosen them up first because they are loose, very loose actually. And we need to make sure. Okay, we need to make sure that we're square. So what I mean by that, there's a reticle, and it needs to be perpendicular or you're know, lined up properly to the barrel. So if you're, if, you're, if you're canted like one way or the other, then as you, let's say you did use that line to help judge distance or help you aim, like hold over, hold under or whatever, it's gonna be off, it's not gonna be straight. So you wanna make sure this is straight. A couple of things you can do, there are some tools you can get that really you're like bang on to the level type straight. Um, the other thing that I do is I simply just sit down, look through the scope, um, check my barrel, and I just see if the alignment is centered to the receiver. I tend to twist my gun when I'm holding it at my shoulder. So if I just look through it and line it up, I'm often crooked. So I have to put it in a rest. 
or, or be really specific, like really pay, pay attention if I'm doing it, just holding. Um, I need to, um, I, as I said, I tend to, I tend to camp my gun. So um, putting it in a rest is really a good way to help. But there are some tools with levels and all kinds of things to make sure you're absolutely square. But if you put a level on your scope and your gun's not level, it, it doesn't work. You got to be able to level the gun and the scope. I don't have those tools with me right now. So I'm going to do sort of my eyeball method here. It's loosened up. Okay. And it's actually from the factory. Not too bad. But for me, the scope is too far forward. So I'm going to twist it, and I'm going to scooch it back. Let me loosen that up a little bit more. Um, OK, so generally speaking here, I like a scope that is back further. I prefer the scope back uh, easier for me to see. Um, these are always too far forward as far as I'm concerned. But um, because of the way this is positioned, I can't actually change that. I can't move this rail back. I can't mount this back here. It is what it is. So I just do the best I can with it. And this is actually not too bad. So if I look now, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit twisted. So I'm going to put that, and that right there is centered. <clears throat> now you would say, Rick, how do you know that's centered? Well. I've sort of mounted hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scopes at this point and can tell you um, that center. As centers, I need it to be for what we're doing today. Let me put it that way. If I was shooting bench rest, like comp competitive bench rest, and I needed to, you know, make sure that I was dead center at 50, 75, 100, 150 yards, well, then that's when I would get a tool out, like something from Real Avid or one of these others that help you absolutely center your scope. But for what we're doing today and for what you'd be shooting in your backyard, this is perfectly fine. All right, so I'm going to try and make sure that the gap spacing on this side uh, is equal to this on this side so that you don't have one side real tight and one side real loose. So I want to bring them down evenly as much as possible. And I, I kind of do it like alternating. So I kind of do a cross pattern. And you know, we're not in a rush here, right? So we're just going to take, oops, just going to take our time. How was I doing that? And then this one, and then this one, and we'll do this one. And this one, yeah, this will work. This one, and 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 this one. You guys get it? We're just going to work our way down. We're not going to try and speed this up or anything. We're just going to let you guys see the process. And as it gets tighter, you don't need to wrench it. There is scope tape. Uh, on these rings that help prevent the scope from slipping. And, oops, wrong way. That's all right. We're okay. Changed up my pattern. Okay. We're just about done here. Just about locked down. Okay, I'm just give one quick check across the rest of these. Okay. Okay, so that is good to go. The other thing is because I've moved this back, it's gonna be less likely to slide because it's right up against this anyway. So, all right, let me get rid of some of this paperwork. And then what we need to do next is I'm going to go and get a target and we're gonna just do a little quick sight in so you guys understand how to make your adjustments on your turret. So give me a couple minutes. I'm gonna go grab a target, move a target. We're gonna we're gonna set up relatively close because that's the other part that's super important. We're gonna talk about that. So I'm gonna stop these cameras. I'm gonna go move some targets around and I'll be right back and we'll jump back into it. Uh, see you in just a minute or two. Okay, so we are about ready to take some of our first shots here. These parts here, are called the turrets. They adjust a tube that's inside the scope 
to make it line up with um, basically where you want the pellet to hit. Now, we've already done a physics lesson, so I'm gonna skip the, the high-end geometry lesson here and just ask you to notice something. This is what I'm looking through, but this is where I'm shooting. Do you notice a problem, right? So th that's the difference, right? So I have to tilt the tube in here so that these are gonna intersect at a particular distance. Now, that's great, but that means that my pellet now is going up to match the, where my sight plane is, and after that position, it's gonna keep going up until it falls back down, okay? So, that's where things get tricky with pelicans, because they don't shoot flat, and <laughs> they always shoot on an arc. And there, there are some, I've done some videos on how to do scope optimizations and all that other stuff. We're not gonna get into that today. I just wanna get you basically on target. But if you find that you sight in at say 15 yards and then shoot at 25 yards and you're off, part of that reason is because of that arc, because of that angle that you're creating. It's, it's tricky, it's part of the fun of air guns if you wanna call it that, I like that. but it can be very frustrating if you don't understand what's going on. And now we have the wind picking up, which is wonderful. It's been wonderfully calm until right now where we go to shoot. So <clears throat> I'm gonna be shooting the red fire pellets and I'm going to be shooting at 15 yards. Now, why, Rick, am I only shooting 15 yards? And where is your gun rest? We're gonna to get to both of those here in a minute. Um, the reason I'm shooting at 15 yards is because if you can't hit something close, you're certainly not going to hit something far away. So the easiest way I have found to get on, at least get on target and learn how to shoot a brake barrel, because there's a technique involved, is to start close. So I will start even sometimes as close as 10 yards, but 15, uh, 12, 15 yards is a good starting point. I've found just over the years, in general, that if I sight in about, and then we're talking like with a Magnum or, you know, uh, one of our modern sort of high-powered springers, that if you're between 15 to 16 yards, zero, it actually gives you a pretty good, uh, I'll say flat in air quotes, trajectory. It's going to vary somewhat. There's going to be outliers on where that doesn't work. But generally speaking, I've found that if I sight in 15, 16 yards, I'm, I'm usually pretty good, like in a hunting, for hunting accuracy, out to about 35 or 40 yards without having to do a bunch of adjusting just for what it's worth apartment. Get rid of this trash here. Uh, first things first, before we even load anything up, we're gonna look through the scope, okay? Now, when I look through the scope, it is um, very fuzzy and blurry. Not just the picture, but the reticle is blurry. There's, on this scope, there's, you have two sort of, a, well, one adjustment and then one magnification wheel. You do not have what's called parallax adjustment. And so what that means is that if I go to nine power and I try and see something at 15 yards, it is really fuzzy and I can't fix that. Okay, so th there, this is probably parallax to 35 or 50 yards, I guess probably 35 or so, um, where things are clear past that for the most part. If I go down to three power, and we're gonna to adjust to make the reticles clear, I should be fine. So, if you're looking through your scope and your crosshairs, the, the you know, your, what's called the reticle, if that's fuzzy, then you need to adjust your eyeball focus, and that's this guy right here. So we're gonna loosen that up, and there is, uh, okay, I wanted to loosen that. Okay, so there's a locking ring here, and then there's this. So I'm gonna turn this, until my reticle is clear. Okay, so about there. Now I'm gonna take my locking ring and I'm gonna move that all the way to where that will now lock into place. Okay, now what has just happened for me is now not only is the reticle clear, but now my target is also clear. If I zoom in, let's see when it starts to get fuzzy. The reticle will stay clear, but as I increase the magnification, right about there, 
which is five power, it starts to get fuzzy. If I were to back the target up, again, this is where that parallax comes into play. If I were to back this up to say 35 or 40 yards, I'd have full range from three to five or three to nine. But we're only 15 yards, so I can really just shoot three power and should be fine. Okay. I may need to come out just a little more. Okay, let me tighten that up. Okay. All right, so before we do anything, we want to talk a little bit about why I'm using a bag and not a rest. Brake barrels, because of the way they recoil, they recoil into your shoulder first, and then when that um, piston hits the front of the compression chamber, it drives the gun forward. Depending on where you have your hand, when that happens, your gun's gonna rock. It, the pellet's still gonna be in the barrel when that happens, by the way. So the, the amount of time it takes for the pellet to get out the barrel, the gun will have already done the forward recoil. If you change your position, then it's gonna change where that barrel is when the pellet exits. So it's super important that you maintain the exact same hold every single time. And also the fact that you're on your hand, is kinda, it kinda gives a little bit. It actually is more accurate. Um, it takes a little extra skill, takes a little getting used to, but it is more accurate when you learn to shoot off a bag using your hand. If you put it in a vise or a rest, you're gonna find that you're, you're just all over the place. The more powerful the Springer, the more dramatic that effect will be. So if you've got like the Magnum here, bag on your hand. If you try and rest it this way and try and go all like this, you're gonna find yourself just all over the map and you're gonna be very, very frustrated. If you learn how to, if you learn the right technique, learn how to shoot off a bag with your hand underneath the gun, maintaining the right same hold, same pressure, same everything, you're gonna find that your accuracy improves dramatically. Also, whatever you're gonna do, like say you're gonna take this out hunting, um, if you're going to go out and hunting, you're gonna make sure, you wanna make sure that whatever hold you're using at the bench, you're gonna be able to re replicate the field because if you're just free holding and you've got your hand in a different place, remember that pellet's gonna leave the barrel at a different point in that angle. So it, you can, you, it, it can be a lot of fun. <laughs> It'll be very frustrating. But once you get it sort of dialed in, it's, it's really a great, it, it's a great shooting exercise. The other thing about it is that um, when you're firing this, you want to make maintain your follow through, which is to maintain a sight picture after you fire and try not to move. Not only will that help you become a better marksman here with your air gun, but if that, that really transitions to firearms as well. And you'll find that if you shoot firearms as well as air guns, you're going to find that you're more accurate with your firearms if you learn this technique. Okay, um, let's get our magazine. Let's get things loaded up. All right, so we've got our red fire pellets. These are just a great hunting pellet for really any of the Gamo guns. They're my go-to uh, for any of their spring guns. They really work well. Now the inertia mag, the way you load it, is you put the pellet in, uh, and then there's a click when you move it forward, and then that stops. Again, the pellet doesn't advance when you're firing, or when you're using the gun, uh, until you fire, and then it advances to put the next pellet into position. And every time you cock the gun, there's a pellet pusher that pushes the pellet into the breech. So pretty cool system. Um, a lot of companies have sort of been abandoning brake barrels and going to like, you know, cheap PCPs. And while that's certainly, you know, I get PCPs are easier to shoot, they can be more accurate, et cetera, et cetera. They do have overhead, they have you need high pressure air and you need a way to keep them full and etc. So brake barrels have a real soft spot in my heart, what I learned on. Um, and all they need is elbow grease, which is great. So uh, if you want to uh, have something that is, you know, you, you say you want to go rabbit hunting anytime and you don't want to have to think about, do I have high pressure air? Gosh, a brake barrel is just a great solution for that. And Gamo is one of, the, one of the few companies, I think, that's really continuing to innovate on the brake barrel side of things. They're always look, they're looking at new technologies, improvements, enhancements to make their guns better. And they've really, I would say, perfected the multi-shot auto-loading system. 
a lot of other companies are trying to duplicate what Gammo's done. They, they haven't yet. The Gammo system really works well. Okay, okay. Let me go ahead and as you cock it, if you notice that rotates into place and when you come back, it's now flat again. It's a very cool system. Now we're at 15 yards and we have not adjusted the scope at all. I'm gonna take my first shot. I'm gonna zoom in just, I'm gonna go to that five power. Give myself a little bit. And I'm gonna aim for, let's see, let's see, where am I gonna balance this? I am going to, that's a little far. I'm gonna back just off that hole a little bit. All right, I'm gonna aim for the top of the, of the ciders, which in the center column is the second bowl down. I don't know where I'm going to hit. Let's see. Way high. Okay. All right. So now we need to adjust this. We're shooting too high. So we need to bring this down. This adjustment moves you left to right and it's labeled. And the way it works that if you are, if you're aiming center, let's say you're aiming center and you're hitting to the right, you're going to move this to the left. Okay. We are hitting high. So I need to move this down. So that's going to go this direction. And because we're so close, I'm moving it a bunch of clicks. Okay, we're a little bit to the right too, but we'll deal with one direction at a time here. All right, so about the same place, loose grip. I'm going to aim for that same bowl. Okay, we moved down some, but not far enough. I'm going to go half a turn. Okay. Okay. We are good up and down. We need to move that over to the left now. So on this knob here, we have a direction that says L with an arrow. We're going to turn that. And that's not that far, so maybe, I'm thinking 10 clicks. Okay, so each click, theoretically, would be like a quarter inch at 100 yards. So if we're at 15 yards and I need to move a quarter inch, that's a lot of clicks. So 10 may not be enough, but let's try it. Same position here. Okay, we need to come over some. I'm in another 10 clicks. Now this is right out of the box, guys. So no break in yet, nothing other than us shooting what we got here. So. We are just going to get it rough, roughed in here. Okay, so we're about good. We need to come down a little bit more. Okay. Okay, getting there. Let's shoot again. Okay, once you're close, you probably want to take two or three shots to see if you've got any flyers going on. So um, if you take one shot and then adjust, another shot and adjust, another shot and adjust, if you do that all the time, you're, you're going to just be chasing your shot all over the place. So once you get close, which we are close now, take two or three shots and then see where that bulk of that group is and then move that group to center. That's, that's what you want to do at this point. All right, so we hit the exact same spot. Let's do one more shot here. Um, cool thing on this mag is you actually have a shot indicator right there, so you know, you know how many shots you have left, which is kind of nice. So you don't accidentally dry fire. Okay. Okay, we're like right on it, right? So um, 
what I'm going to do now, I'm going to load this mag again. Pop this out. Okay. Pop that out. And I'm going to load this mag, and then we're going to shoot two five-shot groups and just see if we're good to go. Now, um, I could fine-tune this a little bit more, but 15 yards is probably not my final zero. Um, I may, if I was really going to dial this in, I would get my chronograph out. Um, I'd get the ballistic coefficient of my pellet. I'd find out, you know, what drag is and all that fun stuff. And, you know, something like chair gun, if you can still find it, it'll tell you basically zero X yards will give you your best, um, your flattest trajectory for, say, hunting. Uh, let's just say you're target shooting at 25 yards and you're in your backyard and that's what you're shooting. You're not hunting. You're just shooting paper at a fixed distance. Well, then really, um, there's really no reason for you not to just put your target at 25 yards, dial in your scope, and Bob's your uncle. You're good to go. Um, and that's perfectly fine. I would personally suggest that you s spend some time at, say, the 15-yard mark um, and just get really consistent so that you can shoot a whole mag 10-shot group or multiple five-shot groups and keep all of your shots in a dime. One that's going to tell you uh, is your gun performing well. That's important. Um, are your pellets doing what you want? Is your scope holding zero? And also, is your technique working? So if you cannot shoot accurately at, say, 15 yards, you're not going to shoot accurate at 25. So, or accurately at 25. So I would recommend, especially new air gunners, don't, you don't need to be Johnny Sniper day one. Spend some time, learn the technique, get used to the gun, get used to the optic, get used to the mechanics, and get consistent at 10, 15 yards, and then begin to slowly work yourself out. And it, it, you'll find that if you do this, you take my advice, and let's say you can shoot dime groups all day at 15 yards. You back up to 20, you, you may see that group open up to an inch, but then you're going to shoot at that 20 yards for a little bit and you're going to see your group shrink because your technique's going to get better. If you do that, you're going to, you're going to be very, very happy with the results. And I will tell you this, if you can learn to shoot a Magnum Springer like this, you can shoot just about anything. It's one of the most difficult guns to shoot accurately, repeatedly accurately, um, that you can buy. It's very hard because of that reverse recoil. It can be very, very tough. But if you can master this, you can shoot just about anything. So let's do two five-shot groups. Let's see how I'm going to do today. i see if I can still shoot a Springer. I'm going to start with the top left bull. We're going to shoot five shots there, five shots on the, on the bull underneath it. And, uh, yeah, then we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. But hope, hopefully so far this has been useful for you guys. All right. Um, you want to get comfortable. You do not want to chase... Uh, the other thing is you don't want to chase the shot. In other words, uh, once you get sighted, kind of close your eyes and open your eyes again and see if you're still on the bull. If you are, then you're at a natural shooting position. If you close your eyes and then open your eyes again and you're not where you were just aiming, you're not, you're not in a natural shooting position. Finding that natural shooting position is so critical and is huge for accuracy for anything, but really with air guns, it really makes a difference. All right, so top left bowl. Let's see what we do here. Uh, I think I need to cock the gun. Look at that. Put the mag in, but didn't cock it. Okay, here we go. All right.
Ooh, I pulled it. Let's put this in the black now. There it is. Okay, we're gonna move down to the target beneath. All right, last shot. All right, I'll take it. That's five shots. Uh, I can't quite see from here, but I bet you I can cover that with a dime. That is what you want. When you can do that every time, like consistently, then it's time to move your target back. Guys, I hope that's been useful. I mean, it is, I know this has been a bit of a long video, but you know, there's a lot that goes into really getting um, proficient with a gun like this. It starts with making sure your scope's mounted correctly, uh, and then it develops into technique and practice and so forth. But the beautiful thing about a gun like this is that all you need is some elbow grease and some pellets and a place to shoot and that could be your backyard that could be your basement that could be my backyard which is several hundred acres right spoiled i know um, but you guys get the idea it's a lot of fun but you do need to put in the work need to put in the effort need to put in the practice and then you can get very very consistent results even out of a big old magnum springer guys that's going to be it i want to say thank you guys for watching if you want to learn more you know check out our channel it's www.arrogantweb.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have videos going up all the time. I hope that's been useful. My name is Rick Huster here with Airgun Web, your home for old school airgun reviews and where we tell you the facts, not fluff. Thanks for watching.